Hello and welcome to the first edition of New Arizona Life and Science. I'm Shane Burgess, Vice President of the Division of Agriculture, Life and Veterinary Science and Cooperative Extension at the University of Arizona. And I'm really excited to be embarking on this incredible project of discovery. I'm here today with Michael Bogan. Michael's an assistant professor in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment. This is the first of our U Arizona Life and Sciences interview series, and we'll spotlight the people and work in our incredibly broad and diverse division. Michael, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Shane. This is wonderful. Yeah, I'm so excited. Your work is something I followed for a long time. Um, I must admit I have to follow it because I am not in your area and I struggle a little bit to understand exactly what it is. So, you know, if I look at your webpage, it says, you know, I work in desert stream ecology. And what does that mean and, and, and why do I care? I mean, I care greatly, but tell me why my subconscious is caring so much. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm a stream ecologist, so I study species that live in or along water and some of the ecosystems that support them. Um, and I do focus pretty much exclusively on desert streams. Um, to me, they're the most interesting types of streams to study because water is so rare in the desert. Um, so you think of the desert, you don't think of water, but, but we do actually have water here. And, and there's a lot going on when you look in the water that we do have. Um, places like Sabino Canyon around here in Tucson, the Santa Cruz River, the Gila River. Um, that, that water really attracts a lot of wildlife in addition to the species that are living in the streams themselves. So even though our streams are a small portion of our desert landscape, they support an overwhelming majority of the biodiversity that we have here in this region. With um, with this with this monsoon, especially following such a dry uh, monsoon year, can you tell us or tell me actually about the resurgence and the biodiversity, and and what you're learning from that that's new to science? Yeah, well, it's you know we're in some ways we're kind of in the uncharted territory here, right? Because we've just finished the driest and hottest year on record. And then we've shifted gears suddenly, like in the course of a few weeks, to the wettest July and one of the coolest Julys that we've had in the past 25 years. Um, so we don't have much of a precedent for these kinds of conditions and these shifts. These are exactly the conditions that we were expecting, given some of the predictions for climate change for our region, you know, that we're going to oscillate between these really dry and really wet periods. Um, so we're, you know, we're, we're learning as we go and seeing how resilient some of the plants and animals are, how quickly they can recover from, you know, both our extended dry period we had before the monsoons and now this extended period of flooding and, and rainfall that we're having during the monsoons. So we, you know, as a thinking about it from a long term perspective, the species that we have in the Sonoran Desert, the species that live in our local streams, they've experienced millennia of, of a wildly variable climate, right? Even before we got into this period of climate change. So we have an expectation that most of them have some kind of adaptation for making it through this extraordinary year that we're in. Um, but certainly some species will do better than others. So I, I got a question given to me that someone really wanted me to ask. And uh, so, so, and I'm not sure whether you can answer this question. I'm not sure I could. Um, so what's it like to have the Santa Cruz River as your office? <laughs> I'm not sure if it's your office or your lab, but anyway, the question one, no. Yeah. I don't know, I can just imagine what do you do? You camp out there with your laptop and that's where you do your work. But anyway, what's it like to have the Santa Cruz River as your office? Yeah, it's fantastic. I would say I use it as my office, my lab, and my classroom all in one. Um, it's, it's, you know, in the past, most of my research has been in faraway places that I had to drive, you know, several hours to a day or two to get to. And it's fun to work in beautiful remote places. I've worked in the Chiricahua Mountains. I've worked all over northern Mexico. You know, and those are fantastic places to go. But it is incredibly rewarding to work in your own backyard, in your own city, and to do work that the people of the city that you live in can appreciate. Um, so I absolutely love being able to ride my bike down to the Santa Cruz when I, you know, do my dragonfly surveys, for example. I love, um, you know, seeing people of Tucson while I'm out there doing the research, while my students and I are out there doing the research, while I'm leading classes out along the river. You know, people will come by and ask questions, ask what we're doing, what we're seeing. Um, and that kind of, of uh, interaction with our community while we're doing our science 
which hopefully is also benefiting our community in the long run, um, is really rewarding to me. Where does the water start? Depends on how you define the Santa Cruz River, but most people define it as starting in um, the San Rafael Valley in southern Arizona. And which then, is, where is it? Which is uh, east of Nogales. Oh. Yep. And then it actually crosses into Mexico, flows through Mexico a while, and does a 180 degree turn north, re enters the United States uh, immediately east of Nogales, and then flows up uh, here through Tucson and and out towards the Gila River up near Phoenix. Um, but, you know, basically anywhere you live in Tucson, you're in the Santa Cruz River watershed. So the water's running towards the Santa Cruz. Right. Sabino Canyon drains to the Rito, which drains to the Santa Cruz. Cienega Creek on the east side, out by Vale, drains to Pantano Wash, which eventually makes it to the Santa Cruz via the Rito as well. So you're in, if you're in Tucson, you're in the Santa Cruz River watershed. But the Santa Cruz River is still even if indirectly, is still the lifeblood of Tucson. It still is connected to our aquifers. It is recharging our aquifers. So when those flows come down out of the foothills, come through the Santa Cruz River, they're seeping down into the aquifer. So anything that we put in that flood water that's going down to the river, we're putting in our aquifer, and eventually we're pulling that water back out through wells, and we're drinking it again. You have eight, more than 8,000 Twitter followers. So... So why have you, why do you put in the energy that it takes to do this? Why is it so important to you that you as a scientist are, are also a storyteller? Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I was kind of um, dragged kicking and screaming into social media by a, a training program I was in, the, the Smith Fellows postdoctoral program. And I did not want to do it. Um, and they made me do it. And I have greatly enjoyed it because, um, because it allows me to communicate both my science um, and then also some of these kind of more philosophical ideas about our water supply and, and water, um, water um, quality to a broad audience, right? Normally we publish papers. We, as scientists, we get our grants. And one of the things we have to do with these grants is publish these scientific papers. And if we're lucky, 10 or 20 people will read it, you know, maybe 100 people if it's a really good paper. Um, but most of the time, and some of those might actually care to reference you, right? <laughs> but most of the time, you know, those things don't get noticed by the vast majority of people. Um, so things like social media, things like Twitter or Instagram, they allow you to, you know, explain your science to a broader community who is never going to read your boring scientific papers. Well, I don't think they're boring, Michael. Well, yeah, and I, I try not to make them boring, but it's they're a little hard to get through sometimes. Um, so it, it allows you to storytell, you know, translate that kind of boring technical science into a common language that anyone can understand and, and do it in often a more visual way. So, I, you know, I try to do it a lot through photography and videography because I think those can communicate some of these things we're talking about. Droughts, floods, water supply, right, ecological restoration. You can communicate a lot through a photograph and a short text description um, that, you know, you could probably spend 20 pages of a technical paper doing and, and not have the same impact. Um, and it also is a two-way communication venue, which is what I really like. So it allows people, for example, in, in our regional community in Tucson to, to speak back to me and reach back to me and say, hey, you know, either you should think about doing this, you know, have you thought about this species? Have you thought about this study area? Or, you know, we've got these water supply issues in our neighborhood. You know, can we talk about that? Can, can you help us with um, some of the research that you're doing? And so I really like that communication angle. And certainly, um, you know, you've got, you've got local a lot and national and international press coverage, which I think is phenomenal. I think it's great that you have. Um, so one of the fun stories, another uh, audience participation one here, um, although maybe I care too. Um, so you had this great video of a coyote and a roadrunner that made national news. And the question I had from somebody was, Whose side were you on? <laughs> yeah, I got, you know, you see... Maybe uh, you can describe this first for those exactly. who haven't seen it. Yeah, you see coyotes and roadrunners often if you, if you spend time outside in the Sonoran Desert. You don't get to see them interact very often, especially not in a, in a cartoon-like way. Um, and so last summer, I was down on the Santa Cruz River doing field work, doing dragonfly surveys, and kind of looked out and out of the corner of my eye caught... Um, first, I caught the, the coyote kind of trotting along and I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. It seems very focused in where it's going. Um, and suddenly then noticed that it was actually chasing after a roadrunner. 
who was trotting along just fast enough to stay ahead of the coyote. And so I immediately, you know, as we do these days, you get your phone out and you start recording. Um, and I captured this interaction and the coyote chased it for probably 20 seconds or so. And then something happened, which never happens in the cartoon. And then as the roadrunner cheated and it just flew away, right? <laughs> and it flew up into a mesquite tree and it, the coyote kind of looked a little dumbfounded by it. Um, and so I posted that and it, it certainly caught the attention of, of a lot of folks. You know, another example of the reach of Twitter. I don't, I don't remember the last time I looked, but you know, that video had been viewed something like 250,000 times or more. Um, and so it was, it was fun to see, it was fun to chat with some of the news sources about that um, kind of typical thing that happens in the desert, but often isn't caught on film. Um, you know, I, it's tough to say which one I favor. I have a soft spot for both species. Um, you know, coyotes, we've tried to, we meaning the United States government, state government, tried to eradicate them from vast areas of our rangelands and our forests for decades. And they outsmarted us every single time, right? <laughs> the wolf disappeared from the landscape, the grizzly bear disappeared, but we could not get rid of coyotes no matter how hard we tried. So, you know, their tenacity, their ability to survive in their cities, I think is fantastic. Um, but a roadrunner, I mean, you really, you can't, like roadrunners are fantastic. They eat rattlesnakes, they eat you know, rodents, they eat other birds. So I, I don't, I can't pick a, a winner in that fight. I, I hope they both win. So Michael, I can't tell you how much fun this has been today. I could speak to you for the rest of the afternoon, but um, with a bio break or two in between, of course. But I mean, thank you so much. It's incredible um, being able to spend this much time with you, listening to you. I'd love to do it again. Um, but, uh, but thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate thank it. You, all Shane. your work that you do and, and your whole team. It's not just you, right? So thanks right. so much. Thank great, you for the great, invitation. Yeah, great to have you. Yeah. So thank you for joining us today. I hope you'll join me next time to learn about another one of the many talented and inspiring people we have in the Division of Agriculture, Life, Veterinary Sciences and Cooperative Extension. See you next time.